Hello, and welcome to the Future Horizons in Climate Science Turco Lectureship. My name is Jim Hurl, and for the past two years, I have had the pleasure and the honor of serving as president of the AGU Atmospheric Sciences section. And each year, the Turco Lecture is a highlight of the fall meeting. This lecture is presented annually and recognizes significant interdisciplinary scientific research, discoveries, or advancements in climate science. Established through a generous donation by Richard and Linda Turco, this lecture identifies future areas of research that will engage both new and established scientific talent in solving the problem of global warming and related issues. This year, it is a great pleasure to introduce a friend and a colleague of mine at Colorado State University, Elizabeth or Libby Barnes. Libby has a Bachelor of Science in both mathematics and physics from the University of Minnesota, as well as a PhD in atmospheric science from the University of Washington. There with her advisor, Professor Dennis Hartman, Libby studied fundamental jet stream dynamics and how jet streams may respond in a warming world. After being a NOAA Climate and Global Change Postdoctoral Fellow in Atmospheric Science at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory of Columbia University, she joined the faculty of the Atmospheric Science Department at Colorado State in 2013. Since then, she has become an internationally renowned scientist for her research on climate variability and change and the data analysis tools used to understand it. Specifically, Libby's research is focused on earth system predictability, jet stream dynamics, Arctic middle latitude connections, subseasonal to seasonal prediction, and data science methods for earth system research, including the emerging area of machine learning applied to geoscientific problems. In addition to being selected to give this year's Turco lecture, Earlier this year, Libby received the prestigious Leroy Meisinger Award from the American Meteorological Society, and she was awarded an NSF, an NSF career grant in 2018. A few years before that, Libby was the recipient of the AGU James R. Holton Award. It's a true pleasure welcoming Libby and congratulating her on this year's Turco Lectureship. Thank you for watching and I am very sure you will enjoy Libby's lecture. It is an honor and a privilege to give the AGU Turco lecture this year. I first wanna thank those who nominated me as well as the AGU committee for selecting me and allowing me the opportunity to share with all of you the work my colleagues and I have been doing on explainable AI for the geosciences. I will point out that I am a climate scientist and so most of my applications will focus around this area. However, I believe that many of the topics that we discussed today are applicable to the much wider audience at AGU. So before I begin, I wanna first acknowledge the many collaborations, discussions, encouragement I've gotten from so many of my colleagues and many of whom are um, co-authors on the work I'll discuss today. But even more importantly, I wanna acknowledge the absolutely wonderful group of graduate students and postdocs that I get to work with every day. Not only do they bring inspiration and excitement to, if you will, the daily grind, but they are behind many of these great ideas that I have the privilege to talk to you about. And finally, I'm gonna do something that's pretty rare in I feel like these types of talks, but I would like to dedicate this talk specifically to the people caring for small children throughout this pandemic. It has been a very, very long year. So I'm a climate scientist. And in our field, we have a very big toolbox um, of, of data analysis tools and techniques to extract meaning from data. Going all the way back, we start with theory to understand the world around us. We have spectral analysis, Fourier analysis, EOF analysis, a very common tool in most climate scientists toolboxes. We have um, Simple, as simple as linear trend detection and trying to detect climate change by drawing a line and showing a trend in global mean temperatures. And we have far more complex tools like data assimilation and full global um, climate models or dynamical models to simulate the world around us. And today I wanna to talk to you about machine learning being an, just another or an additional set of tools for our toolbox. 
Now, when I say machine learning, I want to point out throughout this talk, I will interchangeably use it with AI to stick with particular conventions. Now, what does machine learning have to do with science? Well, in my view, one of our jobs as scientists is to sift through piles and piles of data and try to extract useful relationships that apply elsewhere. The computer science um, community calls this finding relationships that apply out of sample. But in our world, we might just see this as finding relationships that describe physics. And the neat thing is that this is what many machine learning methods are designed to do. So for my outline today, first I'm gonna to talk to you about the use of machine learning in science. Then I'm gonna talk about opening that black box and looking at what's inside, seeing how the machine learning method is learning. Then we're gonna talk about how to use that tool, that open black box, to learn something new about the world around us. And finally end with what I believe are exciting frontiers and critical next steps for our field to continue to incorporate machine learning into our, our science. So there are many commercial applications of machine learning, um, and machine learning has made huge inroads in recent decades. For example, it's been used for very important applications like self-driving cars, natural language processing, facial recognition, and perhaps far less important, things like identifying is this a chihuahua or a blueberry muffin. Now, even with all of these huge inroads that machine learning has made, um, machine learning still fails at times. For example, take an image of a panda and the machine learning algorithm knows and labels it as a panda, but now add some noise to this image and the machine learning algorithm has now decided it's a gibbon, whereas humans, we know this image has barely changed. Another example, take a stop sign and rotate it and it becomes a dumbbell, rotate it further and suddenly it's a racket. And finally, you know, this mushroom is labeled as a pretzel, and that's certainly not a pretzel I would want to eat. So because of these failures and others, this persona of a black box and being unsure of what the machine learning method is learning or why, scientists are often less certain about um, applying it to their fields. Even though, even so, um, science has still already um, used machine learning to make significant advances. For example, distinguishing high energy particles at the LHC, identifying drug-drug interactions, predicting properties of solar flares or um, earthquakes, and finally, maybe the largest region of science that we've seen an explosion of machine learning is that of bioinformatics and um, gene prediction and sequencing. Now, what about our field? Well, this plot just recently came out showing AGU here in the orange line. So these are journal articles published in AGU journals using um, supervised learning in, in the science. And you'll see there's certainly been an upward trend, trend in recent decades of these papers. Focusing more on my area, so climate science or meteorology, um, the gray line shows journal articles published in AMS journals and shows that while there's certainly an upward trend, this trend is much um, shallower than that of the AGU journal, suggesting that the um, atmospheric science community is, has been a bit slower in incorporating these tools into their methods. Even so, um, there's been an explosion of interest in our field in the past two years, but if you go back into the literature, you will actually find that machine learning methods have been applied to atmospheric science problems since the earliest I can find of 1964. And if you look in the bottom right hand corner here, you'll see what this author calls an adaptive logic model is what we would now call a nonlinear neural network. So there's been a range of applications of machine learning for climate science, including things like extreme event and pattern classification, identifying tropical cyclones and atmospheric rivers, um, statistical downscaling and blending, and short term forecasting to predict you know, what the precipitation will be, say, in the coming minutes or hours. On a much larger scale, um, colleagues have been working on weather prediction. In this case, um, Wayne et al. 2020 actually you, um, created an entire global numerical weather prediction model, learning from the data alone, so no physics involved. And finally, and maybe the one that's been talked about the most in recent years, is that of convective parameterizations. The idea that our climate models and our models struggle with convection and machine learning may allow us to find better parameterizations and schemes um, to simulate this subgrid behavior. Now, one of my favorite applications recently 
involves this. So my colleague um, was watching NVIDIA research a YouTube movie showing how they have trained a network, a machine learning method, to take an image where part of the image has been whited out and to infill the image with what it thinks should go there. Now, in this case, the, the machine learning algorithm clearly identified an eye needs to be filled in where it was missing. Um, but you'll, if you look closely, you'll see there's too much makeup on the eye, um, suggesting that the neural network didn't get it quite right. Well, my colleagues saw this and realized that this has applications to temperature reconstruction. The idea that going back to, for example, 1877, um, where we only have a few observations and say ship track data of temperature, he could use this algorithm developed by NVIDIA to act, actually um, infill surface temperatures across the globe. And what's really neat is while we have many reconstruction methods already, this particular method using machine learning um, found strong evidence of a very big El Nino that has been reported um, in documents in 1877. Now, another application of machine learning for climate is separate from climate, the science side perhaps, but it's in communicating climate change, which is another area I think has great promise for machine learning. For example, there's a group working on creating um, accurate and vivid you know, images of what the future might look like for different areas under climate change. For example, it could take your street and show what might happen after a, a flooding event or maybe with sea level rise. Now, why would we want to use machine learning for science? Well, there are a few reasons. The first is just to do it better. For example, um, convective parameterizations in climate models are not perfect, and machine learning could potentially be used to make them more accurate. The second is to do it faster or cheaper. For example, our radiation code in climate models is quite good, but it's very, very slow. So how can we use machine learning methods to speed things up? And finally, the one that I think is talked about far less in the scientific community is the idea that we can use machine learning to learn something new. That is, go looking for nonlinear relationships we didn't know was, were there. And this is what I think is very relevant for research. The idea that if the new algorithm might be slower and worse, but we can still learn something. And this is what I'm going to focus most of my discussion today on. Now, before launching in, let's type talk quickly about the types of machine learning out there. So you might be surprised to learn that you actually use many of these tools already. For example, the idea of unsupervised learning is looking for previously undetected patterns within a data set. For example, EOF analysis or principal component analysis is a type of unsupervised learning, as is clustering methods such as k-means. Now, the other main type of machine learning method is that of supervised learning. And again, this is when um, we take, say, predictors to try to predict some output. And in this way, fitting a line, so that is regression, is a form of supervised learning. Other forms are decision trees and random forests. And finally, perhaps the most famous is that of artificial neural networks or deep learning. And I'm going to focus most of my discussion today on artificial neural networks because that's been the focus of my group in recent years. So when most scientists hear artificial neural networks, if they're unfamiliar, they think, ah, great tool, but it's a black box. So the question then is, how can we leverage advances in explainable AI? That is, how can we open the black box and peer into what's inside? So before we do that, maybe we should step back and answer the question, why should we even care about machine learning reasoning? So as scientists, first of all, our ultimate goal is to understand why. So this may be enough of a reason for you. But I will point out there are other applications where the goal may just to be better or faster or cheaper. But even in that case, it is important that we understand the thought process or the, what, how the machine learning method has learned. And let me go through four of those reasons now. So the first reason is that of building trust. That is, in re recent years, we've seen that the world wants to know how the AI came to the decision that it did. For example, in the EU, they actually have a bunch of guidelines now for trustworthy AI that are working into the legal system. And part of that trustworthy AI requirement is that of transparency, which includes explainability, that is explaining how the AI came to its decision, and the ability of the users to communicate that process to society. Now, the EU is not the only one. 
with these sorts of guidelines, both Canada and the United States have similar type documents circulating now. So what does this mean for science in terms of building trust in the AI? Well, let me give you an example. Humans are greatly impacting the land surface, and this is of particular interest to people studying biodiversity conservation. So my colleagues and I have trained a neural network to quantify the human impact on the land surface and put it in a value between zero and one, where zero means no impact and one means a significant impact on the landscape. When we do that, we can create maps of the human impact on the land surface. And how we do this is we train the, the network to, in to ingest Landsat imagery. For example, here is um, Landsat imagery from um, Sumatra and from the year 2000 on the left and the same location in 2019 on the right. So the neural network has been trained to take these images and predict or approximate the human footprint index. Now, going from 2000 to 2019, the neural network predicts a near doubling of the human impact on the land surface. But we might then wonder why, why did it increase its um, prediction of the impact? And we can use explainable AI tools to make heat maps of the regions that were most relevant for the neural network's prediction. And what we see is the network has put the majority of its focus on the new Trans-Sumatran Highway that just went in in 2019. In this way, we can gain trust in our algorithm that it is focusing on the right regions um, to make its prediction. So this leads me to number two, that is identifying problematic strategies of your machine learning method. That is, we want to ensure the right answers for the right reasons, and explainable AI can help us do this. So here's another example. Imagine we've tasked a, a machine learning method, in this case a neural network, to decide whether there is a horse in a given image. Now as humans, we can look at these pictures and we can say, we know there are horses. And in fact, the AI also said, yes, there are horses in these images. But now the question is, how did it come to this conclusion? Well, we can use explainable AI to once again make these heat maps and the red regions show the regions the network looked at the most or the most relevant regions for its prediction of a horse. And if you squint and sort of turn your head a little bit, you can convince yourself that the network is focusing generally on the regions where there is a horse. That is, it's looking where there are horses and using that to decide if there's a horse. So far, so good. Let's do the ex another example. Here are three more images with, hopefully you will agree, three more images of horses. And once again, the neural network knew or got correct that there were horses as well. Where did it look? Well, when we look at the heat maps this time, we see that the neural network is not putting its focus on the horse, but rather it's focused in the bottom left-hand corner of every image. That is, the network is focused on the copyright symbol of these images to determine if there's a horse in the image. And the reason it does that is most of the horse images that were used to train this network, or at least many of them, came from the same German website that always had the same copyright symbol on it. Now, the reason this is, of course, a problem is if I go out and take a picture of a horse and put it through this network, it will get it wrong because I won't have the proper copyright symbol. Um, and this, of course, is a problem, especially in science. We want to ensure that we're getting the right answers for the right reasons. Okay, so number three reason for um, using explainable AI. That is, at the beginning of the entire scientific process, choosing the ML, uh, one can use explainable AI to help choose the machine learning approach in the first place. So let's return to this example of identifying the human impact on the land surface. Well, when we first started this project, we knew that we wanted to input Landsat imagery um, into the network and that the network would then use that imagery to determine the human impact. But Landsat has many channels um, that it outputs. And the question is which channels were most useful. So at the beginning of this project, we actually used explainable AI to identify which parts of the image or which channels from Landsat were most useful and most relevant to the AI's accurate prediction. And in this example, we see that channel three is most used given the much larger heat map at the bottom. Um, and thus this process allowed us to remove other channels, um, thus saving data storage space and computation speed. And finally, and what I think is perhaps the most exciting, is that explainable AI has the potential to teach us something new. That is, the science can be what the network has learned. In this way, machine learning becomes more than just a prediction. 
That is, once we've trained a machine learning method to make a prediction and it's, say, for example, right, we can go back and ask why and thus have the power of machine learning and data mining methods to answer new science questions. And examples of this um, are coming next. Okay, so let's take a brief look at the progress that's being made in leveraging explainable AI for climate science. So first, what can we expect from machine learning visualization? So just like um, going to, imagine going to the airport and you have your black backpack. You put it through the scanner and you get an, in, you get an inside view of what's going on in there. Um, now, I wanna point out this is an imperfect but valuable view. And in the same way, machine learning visualization tools will help us open the black backpack or the black box, but they will still be imperfect. However, once again, it gives us a view and a sense of somewhat of what's going on inside. And in um, recent years, there have been three, or in the past year, there have been three examples of papers that are talking about tools and opening this black box for the field of atmospheric science, if you are interested in this topic. Okay, so what tools do we use in my group? Well, actually, I've already shown you some examples of this in the previous sections. And our favorite tool thus far is that of layerwise relevance propagation. Now, layerwise relevance propagation works like this. Um, you, let's imagine, once again, we have a network that is tasked with predicting the probability that there's a cat in the image. So we put the cat through the image of the cat through the network and out pops the probability that there is a cat. What layerwise relevance propagation does, or LRP, is it takes that value and it propagates it back through the network to create a heat map of the regions of the input that were most relevant for its final output, that is the probability that there is a cat. Now, I will point out there are many visualization tools coming out of the computer science community right now, but thus far, LRP has been the most useful, useful for our group. And in many ways, this is because it is consistent with how we as climate scientists already analyze and interpret our data. All right, so once again, LRP helps us take this image of a cat and show us where the network looked to determine it was a cat. In the same way, it takes an image of a shark, and if it outputs the probability that the shark in the, is in the image, LRP will give us a heat map of where the network thought was most relevant in that decision. In this case, the dorsal fin pops out as the most relevant, one of the most relevant regions. So how about for science? Well, my PhD student, Kirsten Mayer, has been using layerwise relevance propagation to try and understand subseasonal predictability that is learning climate states that are more predictable than others on subseasonal time scales. So here's how she set up the problem. She's taking daily maps of outgoing long wave radiation in the tropics, which reflects the cloudy and dry or clear regions of the tropics. She's put it through a neural network and it tasks the neural network to predict what the large scale circulation will be over the North Atlantic 22 days later. Now, why did she set it up this way? For those of you familiar, we understand that the Madden Julian oscillation in the tropics is a major source of subseasonal predictability across the mid latitudes. And we want to see how the network uses information about the tropical convection and activity to predict um, the mid latitude circulation um, on the other side of the globe over the North Atlantic. And again, this is 22 days in advance. So Kirsten has done this. And once she has a model with relatively good accuracy, the question now is how did it do it? Where did it look in the tropics to um, find predictable behavior? And that's where LRP comes in. That is, we can make maps that show us the relevant regions of the tropics for this prediction over the North Atlantic 22 days later. Now, Kirsten has used cluster analysis to cluster these LRP maps into two groups. The top group, or cluster one, um, largely looks like MJO phases six and seven, which are consistent with our understanding of tropical extratropical teleconnections. However, the bottom cluster, a, a totally separate um, type of predictability pattern used by the network, um, actually appears to show a very, very strong region of importance or relevance um, in the subtropical jet exit region. And we think this may be indicative of the um, propagation of Rossby waves across the Pacific and out of the tropics into the mid-latitudes. And now this approach has allowed Kirsten to go and start to explore further um, the mechanisms behind this source, potential source of predictability. Now, Kirsten's work is just one example of how we're using LRP in our group. Um, 
And I obviously don't have time to go through all of them, but I wanted to mention that we're using LRP and this type of tool to learn about indicator patterns of force change or of climate change, both in model simulations and observations. We're using it to understand the Cato predictability that is predicting um, weather and climate um, patterns and anomalies years in advance in a similar way to how Kirsten is applying it to subseasonal prediction. And we are using it to, to explore MJO dynamics in physics, MJO predictability, and as I've already mentioned, um, the importance and use of the MJO for teleconnections and predictability elsewhere across the globe. And finally, here at CSU, my colleagues, Kyle and Emma, have been using LRP to understand how their neural network translates GOES satellite imagery into radar reflectivity where no radar exists. In this way, they're able to use LRP to learn what the network has learned is most important about the cloud structure, for example, in converting satellite imagery to this radar reflectivity. Now, I've only talked about layerwise relevance propagation, but I want to point out many other methods exist for visualizing machine learning methods. Um, and, and, and as an example is we have found LRP to be a great tool, but it only applies to a subset of types of neural networks. But there are many other tools and machine learning methods out there. For example, random forests are a well-known um, type of machine learning method, and they too have their own visualization tools. Perhaps one of the more famous one is that of purity importance or feature importance. And in using this tool, colleagues are able to show that when they train a random forest to classify winter precipitation, for example, if it's raining, going to rain or snow, they find that the mean elevated warm layer wind is one of the most important quantities in the random forest's decision of, of this classification. Now I want to talk about something I find incredible. That is the idea of using machine learning methods for equation discovery. Colleagues um, Zana and Bolton recently came out with a paper showing how they use machine learning methods to not only learn a type of parameterization for their subgrid eddy momentum forcing in their ocean model, but that in fact they use the machine learning method to discover the tensor itself, that is to discover and output closed form equations. So in my view, in many ways, this equation discovery is sort of the pinnacle of explainable AI. And it takes us from data back to theory, which is where many of our fields began. So on that note, I would like to spend the last few minutes of my talk looking forward and discussing three exciting frontiers that I foresee for our field in using machine learning in climate science and critical next steps. Um, that I think are, are very important to incorporate these tools. So the first um, sort of exciting area, I think, is that of knowledge-guided machine learning. The idea that as scientists, we have hundreds of years in history of physics knowledge, and that it seems a little odd that we should be throwing it all out the window just to use machine learning methods. So the idea of knowledge-guided machine learning is making physics and machine learning work together, sort of the best of both worlds. Now, why do we need this or why might this be useful for geoscience applications? Well, the first of all is we, as I said, we already have an availability of, of a vast amount of existing knowledge of our field. The second is that earth scientists really wish to gain scientific insights rather than just say get numbers from an algorithm, which is often how they're used in the commercial applications. The earth system's highly complex, but we have limited sample size. And especially when we're interested in extreme, say, extreme weather events, our sample size is diminished even further. So anything we can do to help the machine learning method learn true physical um, relationships within the data is a great idea. And finally, um, using knowledge-guided machine learning and incorporating physics into our methods allows scientists and society um, to be more to potentially increase the trustworthiness of these algorithms and the transparency. The second exciting frontier, I think, that again applies to more than just climate science, but geoscience, is the idea of leveraging our imperfect models, dynamical models, whatever they may be, to try and make them translate better to observations or the real world. The idea is relatively simple. It's that we train a machine learning um, model with climate model simulations, of which we have many, and then we use that, we, we then use observations to tweak that model to try and make it more applicable to the real world. 
And the end result is hopefully a trained prediction model that's leveraging the vast amounts of data we have from climate model simulations, but applies better to the real world. And a great and famous example of this at this moment already is that of Ham et al. 2019, where they show that seasonal prediction of ENSO events is greatly improved when transfer learning is used. And that's shown here from their plot from their paper showing forecast lead on the x-axis and skill of their ENSO forecasts on the, on the Y. And the red line shows um, an improvement when transfer learning is employed. So speaking of climate models, another exciting frontier for machine learning is improving climate model projections. That is, we can bring machine learning methods into the building, the evaluation, and the use of climate model projections. Now, I've already talked a lot about how we can use machine learning potentially to improve our models through improving convective parameterizations or speeding up radiative parameterizations, but what else can we do? So for example, I think we could be exploring emergent constraints across a range of variables and processes um, rather than the more standard approach of just using one variable at a time or one or two variables at a time. I think this could really help us open doors in looking for these emergent constraints that are more complex than just a few variables. Secondly, I think, or next, I think we can utilize machine learning methods um, for both model comparisons with each other and evaluation of models against observations. And finally, just like the numerical weather prediction community po does post-processing on their predictions to try and improve the output of their dynamical models for weather prediction, how can we use and explore machine learning methods to bias correct, if you will, our climate model projections and thus possibly narrow uncertainties for what is yet to come um, for the observed Earth? So those are some three big thoughts of where I think climate, the climate community could really get excited. And finally, I wanna end with one important critical step I think we must do as a field, and that is, something near and dear to my heart. I I think that as a community, we must fully embrace data analysis as part of our field, that is embrace it as much as we've already embraced fundamental physics. For example, think of a typical master's set of required courses. We, we want our students to take the atmospheric dynamics, climate, radiation, cloud physics, but there are almost no programs out there that require data analysis and statistics. In essence, we have given our students a ton of data and a problem that may be one of the most important problems of our time, that of climate change, and we've asked them to build a skyscraper, but we haven't told them how to hold the hammer. Let me give you an uh, example from atmospheric science. When I teach my data and statistics class, I always start my first lecture with this picture. And what I do is I tell my students, okay, here I have taken the R squared of the correlation um, and of the, var or the variance explained of every point on the globe with some climate index that I don't tell them what it is. And I say, why don't you discuss what it is I'm showing here? And some students will get excited and realize that you know, the, the regions of the tropics that's really showing up in this plot is that of where the Madden Julian oscillation is active. So often the NJO will come up in the discussion. But then one student might say, well, hold on a second. You haven't plotted statistical significance. And I'll say, OK, good point. Here we go. I've now stippled the regions that are statistically um, significantly different from zero at 95 percent confidence. And the students will say, oh, OK, this must be the NJO. And then, of course, I get to to give the punchline, which is the fact that I didn't use a known climate index at all, but rather this is pure Gaussian random noise that I have correlated with the globe. So with over 40,000 or more grid points on the globe, the possibility of spurious correlation is frightening. If our students cannot understand this concept, how are they going to interpret and apply the millions of free parameters within neural networks? Now, recently, there have been many courses developed um, by my colleagues of, for data analysis for both undergraduate and graduate level education in our field, but we still need more. And I want to also note that many of these opportunities and trainings and workshops are really geared at graduate students and postdocs, and certainly they are the future of the field, 
But I actually think we need to be offering and encouraging training from basic statistics through machine learning for all career levels, as this is as much a part of our field as the fundamental physics. And finally, incorporating machine learning and fully embracing data analysis tools into our field requires that we move beyond off the shelf approaches that are handed to us from the computer science community. That is, we need to start exploring and developing these tools specifically for our field's needs. An example of this is I've talked a lot about layer-wise relevance propagation, which came from the computer science community. And my postdoc, Antonius, has been asking, well, how well does LRP apply to our field? So what he's currently doing is he has created a nonlinear function f that he knows exactly. And he is using it to quantify the true contribution of every pixel on the globe to, globe to some value y. He is then going back and training a neural network to approximate f and ask, um, how well does LRP do in um, estimating these contributions? In this way, as a field, we really need to start both exploring the tools being handed to, over to us from outside the community, as well as creating new ones that apply to the problems that we have in hand. And with that, I want to end with four main thoughts um, from this talk. The first is our field is well poised and ready to leverage machine learning for science. Given the vast amounts of data we have, both from observing the Earth system, but also from comet models and their simulations, the possibility exists for huge advances to be made. Number two is that machine learning methods are no longer black boxes. Tool exists to help visualize their decisions. This means as scientists, we can finally ask why. Number three is we need earth scientists working with machine learning experts to develop explainable AI methods that are tailored to our field's needs. Now, while this sounds like a lot of fun to me, it's not just a lot of fun. It is also essential for the proper use of AI for climate science and funding needs to support this. And data analysis methods are an integral part of our field and we should treat them as such. This means educating ourselves all of us, and it starts with an understanding of foundational data analysis and statistics. And so I'll leave you with my final thought for this talk, which is interpretable machine learning can open new doors for climate science if we wield it carefully and intelligently. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Libby. Really appreciate you, that. Like, yeah, very good. And I'm sure if we were in person with all the audience members, there'd be a wonderful round of applause right now. So this is a virtual round of applause. So I'd like to remind the audience, we have opportunity and some time now for question and answer. So please post any questions you might have for Libby directly into the, uh, into the uh, Q&A tab. Um, I was just wondering, maybe you could say a little bit more. You gave some really compelling examples about how neural networks can be used uh, in climate prediction across a range of time scales from S2S time scales to decadal time scales. Now, when you train these models, you have to decide which variables to train them on. And I assume if you're doing something like looking at MJO and teleconnections, you know, you might train it on OLR or something like that in the tropics. How, can you just make some comments about how you go about deciding which variables upon which to train these models for various classes of prediction problems? Yeah, sure. So um, it's interesting. You'll actually get a different answer from the people in different fields on this question. So there, there, oftentimes um, my data science colleagues are sort of take the mindset of throw everything at it. If you have the data, throw it, stick it in a big computer and, and see what it spits out. Um, and that is one approach. I guess one of the reasons I, I, you know, I am a domain scientist is what they like to call it or a climate scientist. And so um, I tend to say this is where the science actually gets to come in, right? This very first choice of what variables to use. 
Now, it's a, it's a bit tricky on the one hand. So the example I showed, we only used OLR. Um, but why only OLR? Presumably, there's other important variables out there. And, and actually, um, one of my postdocs, Zane Martin, is exploring when you add more and more variables, which variables become the important ones? And can we learn something about MJO dynamics from the extracting which variables were useful and which ones you know weren't, weren't useful at all for for the algorithm um, so that is just for that problem i think you know across time scales this is again i think where science comes can come first rather than and i guess maybe the old school machine learning way of thinking which is just give it all the data and it will tell you everything you need to know and i think that that mindset is really um, going away now in large part because of some epic failures of machine learning in really important situations. And, and so this physics guided machine learning aspect has, is, is coming to the forefront, not just in science actually, but actually in the computer science community. Um, they may not call it physics, they, they may call it knowledge guided machine learning at other times, but this concept that if we don't wanna overfit, that is if we want the right answers for the right reasons, that stop sign cannot become, you know, a, a dumbbell, um, then, then we need to start putting actual knowledge in. And that knowledge may be of the form of the variables that we choose. So that I know there are lots of ways to answer that question, but I think it's a it's an optimistic one, which says as scientists, we have a lot to say and a lot, lot to give um, in, in setting up these these methods. Great, thank you. Uh, so we have uh, quite a few questions appearing in, in the box. Thanks to the audience for that. Um, I wanted to ask a question from Kelsey Best. First of all, says thank you for an incredible talk. And then, uh, do you think there is a future for machine learning in studying coupled human climate interactions? Can social sciences and climate sciences work together to utilize machine learning in this space? Um. Great question. Uh, I think I may I I'm excited about this as a tool. So my answer tends to be always absolutely yes. We but we need to make sure we have both the climate people and the you know the the social science people together working on this topic. Um, I think that part's absolutely critical. Thinking about what goes in, what comes out, does it make sense? Um, again, are we are we just looking at the caption in the image or not? So I think I, I really see this as a tool. And so if there are complex interactions and you have the data, and I did not talk about that here, but the methods I've really um, explored in this talk with you are big data methods. They do require a lot of data. So if you have five data points, don't bother with a neural network, you know, fit a line, it's great. Um, nothing wrong with fitting a line. So I think if the data is there, and my guess is in this situation, it's possible that that could be tricky. I'm not sure what would exactly the question you're asking. Um, but I, I think there's a lot to be done here, especially I, I tend to say, you know, I got into to atmospheric science because the Earth system seemed to be one of the most complicated systems I could think of. The only more complicated one being humans. So in that sense, I think human climate interactions certainly are a, a, a fun way of direction to go. Yeah. Great. Thank you. I have a question from Lisa Donor. It says a uh, very practical question. How much programming versus statistics is needed to engage in these methods? Do students need a programming class to engage in machine learning data treatments? Oof. Um, okay, great. Currently, and I may change my mind in a few years on this one, I have thought hard on this one, but I, I think programming is pretty uh, an important piece. And let me tell you why. I think. Getting in, these methods are not one size fits all, just put your data in and out pops an answer. They require, um, if you will, to get familiar with the method, to learn how sensitive it is. When you, when you change what your data sets, do you get a totally different answer? And a part of that requires interacting with these methods in my view. Um, and in that sense, I think the programming aspect is potentially important. With that said, I'm not trained as a computer scientist, nor are any of the people in my group. And so I think um, it, you know, just today, the TensorFlow and PyTorch, the two main um, 
machine learning programming languages out there really are straightforward if you are familiar with general programming practices. They don't require anything more in depth than that. Um, but I think the concept of using these me methods without any programming and sort of putting it into a GUI, that still makes me quite nervous, um, given how they can fail. Great. Thank you. Okay, so uh, James Larson has a question. First of all, he says this is a thought-provoking talk, so thank you, Libby. Thank you. What are your thoughts on how potential cultural and systematic biases coded into the machine learning algorithms affect the outputs? If there are adverse effects, how can geoscientists account for these when using machine learning in their research? Yeah, okay, this is a big deal. So um, we've, we've read in the news, especially recently, about um, many examples about how, and yet at the end of the day, these are not magic wands. They learn from the data they are fed. And so if, especially um, if systematic biases are in that data, for example, when we see things, uh, there's been studies on say facial recognition. If the data is focused more on one type of face than another, that will be reflected often in the machine learning outcomes and the predictions. Now this is a little different potentially you might think than for science, but here's an example of how my bias is going in. Um, again, we come back to our S2S prediction problem. We put in, you know, OLR as our first, or outgoing long wave radiation as our first guess for the variable we would chose we chose. Um, you could call that science coming in, but you could also call that potential bias in what we think the algorithm should give us. Um, and so in that sense, I think there's certainly, we, we need to be careful as simple as, as that. Um, with that said, I think the, the best thing we can do as a starting point for these biases coming into our science is the explainable or interpretable AI component understanding how it's making its decisions is sort of the first step in figuring out what types of biases and issues we are already putting into that algorithm. And so this is why I don't, as I, I said before, even if you're not trying to learn something new, even if you're trying to do it faster, better, or cheaper, these methods are, these interpretable AI methods are essential for doing it right and accounting for some of those issues you bring up. Great. Uh, Debay asks, great talk, Libby. Uh, can you elaborate on how big data, like from uh, sensors from space to UAVs, is driving, feeding into real-time decision-making from weather to climate to even things like fugitive gas leak location detection is area of work. So Oof, big data okay. is driving, feeding into real-time decision-making. I mean, I, I would argue that already our numerical weather prediction is big data being fed into real time um, uh, prediction problems. I think right now I have quite a few colleagues that are starting to think about using and, and already at, at national labs thinking about machine learning for real time prediction and evaluation across the geosciences. Um, but over and over, one of the things that keeps coming up is often there's already forecasting or a forecast approach in place that maybe didn't use machine learning before. And those forecasters, if we take the example of, say, severe weather prediction, those forecasters have a, a dearth of knowledge, you know, so much knowledge themselves. And now they're being confronted with this, again, black box that's telling them, you know, to predict a storm over one location when they feel like or their other models tell them it's in another location. And so once again, the issue of trustworthiness um, is coming up over and over is how can as humans and actually this comes back into the human interaction part is as humans, we are a part of this process. We need to trust the algorithm. It's not just, you know, a robotic numbers in numbers out process. And so um, in that sense, I think there's been quite a bit of hesitation in putting these into real time too quickly um, and making sure that we really know what we're doing, which is once again, I'm gonna sound like a broken record, but maybe that's not so bad, which is why we need to explore these interpretable and explainable AI methods for our specific applications. I th they are absolutely essential in my view to using these um, going forward. Great. We're getting plenty of questions, so we'll get through as many of these as we can in the next 10 minutes or so. Here's one I want to ask you because it relates to LRP, one of your favorite topics. Yeah. So again, uh, the question is, thank you for the great presentation. I have a question about LRP. There is a sort of linear assumption during backpropagation in LRP. How does that linear assumption affect the explanation? 
how is collinearity in data result by LRP? Okay, so so yes, there there's the linearity though is not a linear linearity of the entire function. It's just of the the very local space, which is often already um, assumed when you train a neural network, just in the general backpropagation process. Um, so part of the question though, how does that affect your result? I don't know. That's actually one of the reasons we're exploring this is um, many of the, the the great group that came out with LRP, many of their examples require human intuition in looking, say, at a cat or a shark and saying, oh, the network looked in the right spot. It looked at the dorsal fin. That's how we know LRP is doing the right thing. But in climate science, we don't always know the right answer. We don't have this obvious dorsal fin to look for. Um, and so we actually need to be more systematic in evaluating how good is this method. And so this, this is one of the reasons I think that, again, delving into these, these tools coming from the computer science community and, and throwing our own data and problems at it is really important. Um, you did ask about collinearity. LRP does fine with collinearity itself, and that's actually because in the training of the network, um, we actually took that into account. Specifically, um, oftentimes you will use what's called L2 or ridge regression to try to account for that collinearity in your input that is both spatial and or temporal correlation across the data, which in geoscience we deal with all the time. Um, so LRP doesn't have a problem with that. Great, thank you. Another uh, very practical question from Oliver. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Do you have any particular suggestions for textbooks or resources for data analysis courses aimed at atmospheric science students? Oliver, believe it or not, this is one of the hardest questions I get asked. Um, so there, there are a few good books out there. Um, actually, here we go. This is, this is an advertisement. This is one of my favorites in the group. Here we go. Um, so if you're looking for a textbook to read, this is a good one. Um, but otherwise, I think, unfortunately, I think some of the problem I've had is our field speaks a different language in many ways than the computer science um, community. And when I pick up a computer science paper, honestly, there are symbols in there I've never seen before. And I have an undergrad math degree, right? So it's just, it's just out over parts of it are just not in, in my repertoire. And so I do think the best place to start um, is to actually first get data, get a problem that you understand and, and start with the basics and set up something simple um, and, and, and start to play with the code. I don't think a textbook at this time has been written yet for our community um, in, in quite the right way um, to explore these topics. Um, and the other thing is, I think it. it at least it's been the buddy system so far, which is unfortunate, right? Um, I teach, for example, in my class, I have a section on machine learning for climate science, and I'm sure there will be many of those in the coming years. We have tutorials put on by NCAR. It's an AGU tutorial. Um, but I think it's really right now, just these few papers are coming out that are um, that I, I mentioned talking about explainable AI. Um, but I think really at the moment, it's getting your hands dirty. And then you're always welcome to send me an email um, with questions because I love talking about this stuff. Great, thank you. A uh, question from Bernard says, how to handle extreme events, which first are rare events within data, and second, do not follow Gaussian statistics, but typically large deviation? Yeah, so, oh. yes, um, this is where I think things like transfer learning could be critical, and that is we need more data to learn these extremes. I do believe there are many problems in our field involving extremes that machine learning at, at the present time just may not be the right tools for because we may not have that data. Um, but transfer learning, if your climate models can sort of get the right processes and tails, um, you can train your methods on that data, which may be imperfect, but you can train it to learn something about, say, the large scale features that drive these extremes and then go later to apply it and, and tweak it with the small amount of observational data that we do have. Um, I do know there are many people studying this problem, whether there are certain um, you brought up Gaussianity. Um, there are certain methods out there for transforming your distribution. And actually, the machine learning methods are, do a better job when you've when you've made it more Gaussian-like, and then you know you can always transform it later. Um, but I, th I think 
we have to be careful and intelligent with when we're dealing with uh, with those tails, especially now you want to talk about, say, how tails of the distribution will change in the future. So now we have a, a basic climate state that's not even stationary. Right. And it's changing. And what happens if we train our network on observations today? Will it apply to extremes in the coming decades um, that, again, is, is a very tricky problem that people I, I don't think anybody has a great answer for yet. Great. Maybe a couple of more questions um, from Wenqing Wang says, incredible talk, Libby. May I ask uh, what measures you usually take to make sure the input data quality is good enough? Oh, yeah. So I, I unfortunately, I'm a cheater and I use mostly climate model data and reanalysis. So in that sense, um, and the problems I'm looking at are so large scale that I typically am not thinking as much about, you know, the errors on the observations or the input, for example. However, there are many people in both within the, um, our field, but also the computer science community that are thinking about how do we propagate uncertainties through these networks, especially when actual observations are being used with known error bars. How do, how do we keep that information? Um, as, as we use these methods. And this is this sort of uncertainty quantification is a huge area of growth right now in um, machine learning and AI approaches. Uh, in terms of just how do you know that your data is the right data? I think, again, this is where science and physics really can play in and saying, do you think there's a relationship between this variable input and output? Um, why do you think that's there? Do you have reason to believe it is, um, et cetera? Okay. Anthony asks this very straightforward question. If you add variables without careful consideration, can you get the wrong explanation? Can you get the wrong? So I don't know about wrong, but you do have to be careful. So especially with, with when you have multiple variables that say are mechanistically linked. So they both say describe the same type of information. If you put one of them in and it comes out as important and the other one doesn't, it could just be that they're, again, they have collinearity. That is, they explain the same variance. So the, the, the neural network has just decided to focus on this one and that to ignore this one. So in that sense, if you put in different data sets, you have to be careful how you, you interpret um, what its output. I wouldn't call it the wrong answer. I would actually call that user error in that case. As, as scientists, we have to know what we can and cannot say from the methods we are using. Great, thank you. So Xin Zhao says, uh, very nice talk. Uh, they all start with very nice talk or great lecture, Libby. So, uh, they know I won't answer the question otherwise. <laughs> you mentioned promoting machine learning and atmospheric science, but few programs are providing data analysis courses. I know many people are thrilled about machine learning, but do not know where to start. What do you think we can do better? Are you considering online courses, for example, to make the methods that you're using, Libby, reach out to more people? Thank you very much. Yes, I am considering that. Honestly, um, one of the things, and maybe with, with this audience, if, if this type of thing is of interest, I would love to get an email, actually, because um, at the same time, at, at AGU, AMS, NCARD, there have been so many, say, summer schools and online workshops. Sometimes I wonder if people have sort of had it with, with sort of machine learning for climate science tutorials. On the other hand, there, you know, there is a place potentially for a more, um, a, more of an online course approach, you know, with assignments and things. And that is something I do do in my class. I will say that, um, I openly share my, my, my material for that class with others starting similar programs um, in their institutions. So if it, that is of interest, I'm always happy to share if you reach out. Um, I do think, however, as a community, we can do better. And I think maybe, you know, maybe one of the reasons is, is just this is early days. People are just now deciding, hey, I should start paying attention and, and I should, you know, learn something about this. Um, but yes, I think we can do better. I unfortunately don't have the perfect answer yet. Um, However, I think the, the place to start is actually not machine learning. It's in the basic data analysis. And I do think that's important. We need to make sure our students and ourselves understand the fundamentals because they're, they are critical, in my experience, to interpreting and understanding these more complicated um, tools. 
Okay, we'll try to squeeze in one last question in the last 55 seconds. Uh, so Todd Mooring says, how much of the prediction enterprise can machine learning consume? E.g. machine learning is arguably underrated as an S2S prediction method. So just sort of how much of the prediction enterprise can machine learning take over here? I, I think, okay, I have 40 seconds. I think in the next few years, it's going to consume a lot of it, honestly. However, I think ultimately one of the biggest benefits we're going to get, because ultimately it's just learning from the data, and it doesn't have all of our physical equations in it. Um, I think one of the big things it's going to do is it's going to teach us where we have predictability that our dynamical models may not yet see. And it's going to potentially feed back and really help us improve our dynamical models. So I don't see a future where all dynamical models are thrown out the window and it's all data, you know, just learn from the data via these tools. I really think they're going to be integrated and start to be integrated into a process going back and forth. Um, you know, sort of waxing and waning with our dynamical simulations as they continue to improve from what we've learned from these more data intensive tools. Great. So thank you very much again, Libby. Congratulations on the Turco lectureship. Thank uh, you, fantastic, everybody. fantastic talk. And I'd like to thank uh, all the people who are attending this session live on a, on a Friday evening yeah. or a Saturday uh, to thank you very much. Um, so Everyone be safe, stay healthy, have a great weekend. Thank you again, Libby. Virtual applause. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.